podcast. This is what episode 176. Is that right? Yeah, I think it's 176. That sounds about right. I'm um, I'm good with 176. How's everybody doing today? Hope everyone's having a wonderful day. We're going to be talking all about pivoting and why it's so important with businesses, with hobbyists, with whatever you're into. Pivoting has a lot, a lot of value and can often be the thing that will save you from burnout and in a business, save you from complete and utter failure. So those are some things I think is good for us to kind of discuss here. <laughs> so first off, got some awesome people here hanging out. If you are watching live, leave a like, subscribe, all those things, share with your friends, bring other people in here. Um, we are attempting to find a second host. So that, that is going to be something that I'm working on. Um, we want a second host on here so there can be more of a back and forth like we had last week versus just Grant talking. So if you guys have anyone that you think would be a good host uh, to join me, let me know. And uh, would love to have them on here so we can talk about it and kind of discuss we got some awesome people here hanging out 3d medic fence is here max is here 3d print junkie phantom printer jake the joke goat simon snow duff fj prince mike from never let the machines win kevin deck you all are here thank you all for coming out showing support and enjoying pivoting is a tough one right we were going to do this week on a business plan and a marketing plan it's one of the things that I want from inventors when inventors come and work with us. It's something that I firmly believe is, a, is an important part of the inventing process. But I didn't know how well that would resonate with the hobbyist crowd, right? The hobbyist crowd is a little bit different where hobbyists don't need marketing plans or business plans. But hobbyists will most likely need to pivot at some point, whether that's because of a burnout, because this technology just isn't what it used to be. They don't like the hobby anymore. And so a pivot is a requirement, whereas a marketing plan for a hobby is not. I mean, <laughs> other than how to make sure you don't piss off your friends by talking about the hobby too much, there really isn't much of a reason for a marketing plan. I'm also going to try a much closer microphone experience for the podcast. Um, I'm still trying to practice good microphone etiquette. You don't see it on camera. Uh, it is, oh, I can actually move it up a little bit, a little bit. Oh, oh there it is. Okay. And that way you get more of the deep podcast voice that we could have on a show like this, but I don't want to show my microphone because I just feel like that's mildly inappropriate. Um, not inappropriate? I don't know. Unprofessional? I don't know. Some people seem not to care. I care about it apparently way too damn much. <laughs> but Anyways, pivoting is, well, kind of an important thing. So I've been starting to, like, ask chat GPT about the topics that I want to do so that I have a definition that it provides versus my own definition. Um, so we can... I. <laughs> we can kind of, you know, talk about that, I guess, as well, but... I'm going to read off ChatGPT's definition after I talk about mine. So my idea and my understanding of a pivot is businesses will make it to go into new markets, change the markets that they're in. It is an effective way to maintain your business surviving. It is a great way to change your sources of revenue and sources of income and diversify said revenue streams. That is part of the deal. According to ChatGPT... A pivot in the business context refers to a fundamental change in a company strategy or direction, often in response to market feedback, challenges, or emerging opportunities. This strategic shift can involve changing the company's business model, target audience, product or service offerings, or even its marketing approach. Pivots are common in startups and small businesses that are searching for the most effective way to grow and become profitable, but they can occur in businesses of any size and at any stage. The goal of a pivot is to help a company better align with customer needs, market demand, or to capitalize on a new opportunity that offers greater potential for success 
pivoting can be a crucial decision that allows a business to thrive in a competitive environment, adapt to changes in the market, or survive when the original business model is not performing as expected. I explained most of that <laughs> in half the time. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of what a pivot is, right? A pivot is just a change for a reason, right? Often that reason is to stay valuable in the industry. So a lot of you will notice that we've done some changes here at 3D Musketeers. Maybe you have noticed, maybe you haven't. I don't know. We're going to talk about them further on. We're going to talk about some of the market pivots that we are making as a company. And that's just because the technology and the forecast for the industry is changing. And that means if we don't improvise, adapt, and overcome as a business, we will we will fail. Any business will fail. Any hobby will fail. That is not continually being looked at and said, do I like this? Is this giving me what I need? Is this doing what I need it to do or what I want it to do? Is it solving the problems that I have? And is it providing to me what we have and what we need? So that's that's a thing, right? Um, pivoting is apparently more than just a Friends episode, and I'm going to... Uh, release something that maybe people will judge me for but i never watched the show friends so i didn't even know that was a reference um why did i think it was a seinfeld reference which i've never watched seinfeld either i don't have much of a life outside of this business i'm sorry um you know work is what it is it's work but and i spent a lot of time doing this but i like it i enjoy it and, you know, part of a pivot is understanding what that looks like. But being able to purposefully pivot in a productive way, I like, I like the P alliteration, though those are always good, means that you're doing it with reason. A lot of people will just jump into a hobby or jump into a business headfirst without a lot of value, with a, a, not a lot of understanding, with not a lot of care. They're just going to jump into it. And... It will be what it will be. But that's not a great way to run a business. If you want to just jump head first into a hobby and enjoy it, great, by all means. But we find out very quickly that one 3D printer turns into four 3D printers, which turns into a lot of filament being stored, which turns into a lot of 3D prints being made, which turns into, I have to get rid of these, which naturally goes into, well, what if I could just sell the 3D prints that I have? And then that hobby becomes a job. And for any of you that have turned a hobby into a job, a lot of you know that that passion, that drive, that desire is gone pretty much as soon as it becomes a source of income. Because it's no longer about what you like doing. It is all about what makes you money. See, a hobby takes money away from you. It doesn't bring money in. A business its sole purpose in life, its sole purpose in life is to make money. If you have other goals in a business other than making money, that's fine. But the business's first thing is to make money. And if it's not to make money, you don't have a business, you have a charity. But even charities make money. They just reinvest it, right? That's how nonprofits work. We can go into that one time, but I feel like that is well beyond the scope of these uh, type of discussions. And Project and Dad's Garage says that's why I keep hobbies and work separate. And apparently that Friends episode would have been when I was a kid. Buddy, I, 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 I like think of your traditional geeky kid. That was me, right? Like that, that was me. I didn't, I didn't know what Friends was. I didn't really watch a lot of, like, that type of television. Like, didn't watch sitcoms as a kid. Um, but, yeah. Pivoting is... Pivoting is a little bit complicated. But it doesn't have to be a massive shift. I find that pivots for businesses are something that just kind of come naturally. If you are looking at your target audience, 
and where your actual money is coming from, you will likely find that those two things don't always align perfectly and that you need to make some small changes to make that happen. Now, some might call that a slight redirect for your market. Others might call it, well, something way bigger and call it a pivot. I think it's important that we do call even slight adjustments to a company's like kind of business offerings a pivot because to me that's what it is. If your business is doing something that it didn't intend to do when it first came out, you have pivoted. Maybe it took six months rather than six hours, but it's a pivot. Pivots don't always have to happen immediately. Let's look at the industry as a pivot, right? 3D printing has had a massive pivot in the past three years. We've gone from an industry that was just trying to find the cheapest Ender clones that we could to now it's the cheapest bamboo clones that we can get. And it's no longer about who can be the cheapest, who can be the cheapest, who can be the cheapest. It's what value do these printers bring to the market. It's why this new Frozen Arco has so many people that have backed it on Kickstarter that did their their pre-order thing that they've looked at doing. And I, even I reached out to Frozen. I sent them an email to see if we could get one for review because, yeah, honestly, it looks like it could be a machine one of the first ones in a while that could actually give the Bamboo Lab X1 Carbon a run for its money. It's a 2.4 Voron is what it looks like with an AMS on it. And that would kind of tick a lot of boxes that people have. But we've looked at adjusting what our needs are as a community. And so the industry as a whole has pivoted to meet those industry needs. Creality without having any valuable change to it, right? This is a common thing that we saw from Creality for almost a decade. Now that Bamboo is here, Creality's had to pivot to also including things like, you know, uh, like the K1 Max, the K1, and now the K1C, which I think we all know is designed specifically to try to compete with the X1C because there is no other reason that you would name a product basically two of the three of the same letters and numbers, right? Like, it's just one letter different. It Otherwise, the products have roughly the same name. And while K and X are not close to each other on a keyboard, it's not impossible for somebody to find a Creality product when they're trying to look for a bamboo product. Product Dazuraj says, anytime you have to do something, it doesn't matter how much you love doing it, you will grow to hate it. I don't know if I will ever grow to hate 3D printing, but I will certain I certainly have grown to be a little bit jaded to it. I don't do a lot of projects for myself unless it solves a problem, right? We're going to be doing a video on the uh, PO Poly Magneto X. That's Wednesday's video, by the way. We're going to talk about my experiences as a beta tester. We're going to talk about some of the challenges that the machine is facing. We're going to talk about some of the future of that machine. And I enjoy that machine. But I'm really only using it right now because we're testing it like crazy. It is not ready for prime time, not in my opinion. It's a great machine, but it has some pretty rough issues that I'm running into, and I know that I'm not the only one running into it. But recently, I solved a problem. I'll show it on screen, and I'll try to describe it best for you guys. This is a field monitor. So this is a screen used for cameras if you don't want to have, um, you know, looking at the camera screen. So when we go out and we film out in public, outside of, you know, the shop here, Amber is normally the camera operator. Well, Amber is about a foot shorter than I am. And for her to look up at the camera screen all the time, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So we got a field monitor. Well, the problem with this field monitor is that it overheats. It's hot and humid here in Florida, and so the field monitor gets hot and humid, and it tends to overheat. I solved this problem by creating air ducts, utilizing a pair, oh, they're over here, a pair of 30 by 10 millimeter blower fans and a custom-made duct. It took two prototypes to get this one perfect. I'm happy with it, and we tested it at 35C for two hours, and it was happy no issues. But that is a product that I made because we had a necessity 
not because I wanted to. There's a huge difference between want and need. And that's where this issue that Project at Dad's Garage is talking about. You might want to do 3D printing, and that's fun. But as soon as you need to do it, your want to do it goes away because it feels more like work. Now, there are amazing ways that this desire comes back, that you can easily find this passion once again. But it's not always that simple. And maybe finding your passion is a great episode for the podcast. In fact, I'm going to write that down because I think that that's an important one. Because finding your pivot, or finding your pivot, finding your passion is something that it, it, once you find it, we have a tendency to try to make money doing it. And a lot of people will then lose that passion because they're trying to make money doing it. But I will say the kind of market itself changes. And when you're not willing to make a change with that market and you're not willing to kind of flow a little bit, right, you don't need to be as fluid as the market, but you can't be so rigid that you're going to stand in the way of the market because I regret to inform you, but you're not big enough likely to influence a market enough likely to have any reasonable change occur. So instead of trying to fight the market, go with it, right? A lot of you that are running you know, printer as a service businesses, right? Very similar to what 3D Musketeers do, are realizing that your sales are probably falling off. And unless you're playing the high volume, low margin game, which I refuse to play, that's a ridiculous game. That's a fool's game as far as I'm concerned. Um, then you are seeing your sales drop. I know we are, and I know a lot of the print farms that I talk to, we are all seeing our sales drop because people are seeing that 3D printing is nowhere near as hard as it used to be. That's okay. See, I much prefer to have clients that will feed me projects that take 12 hours that make me $500 rather than the products that take five hours and make me $20. I'm okay if we have less machines working. But that means we're going to downsize our machinery. We're going to look at being very purposeful with the machines that we keep in place. It means that we're going to start evaluating machines like the Magneto X specifically for a print farming application where it could be used to produce parts over and over and over again to come between the injection molding and the regular 3D printing to provide a somewhat short to medium run manufacturing at an affordable rate, more affordable than one onesie, twosie parts, but less affordable than an injection mold. Well, the injection mold also has the massive mold cost. So th there are some barriers to entry for injection molding. And maybe that's a good one for us to talk about too, talking about injection molding versus 3D printing. It's been a while since we've discussed that. That'd be another good one to have Nero on for, eh, given his history and all of this. But, like, let's look at what happened during human malware, right? These restaurant businesses had to pivot overnight to doing home delivery. They had to pivot overnight to deal with things like drivers getting into the food. Great, we can make a sticker to stick the bag shut. Um, how do we make it so that the product isn't, like, mushy by the time it gets to the person how can we ensure the quality of the product gets to where it needs to be that's where we as 3d musketeers pivoted during uh human malware if you will to do a lot of food packaging we were one of the top facilities for doing prototype food packaging out there period but now that things have changed a little bit Industries like the food service industry are less dealing with delivery and the ones that are still dealing with it don't need those services anymore because they already have the products and they work. This is the problem with being really good at product development. It means that your clients come once and then they never come again. Um, you know, they get what they need, then they're gone. But see, you hope that you do such a good job they tell others about it. That's part of the deal with this process. When we look at the like that purposeful pivot, right, it is good to understand where you're lacking and where you need to be. Like I said, I believe that a pivot is something that occurs naturally, 
right? You don't just sit there and say, well, we have to change. No, if you weren't already making that change before you realize it, then you're probably too far behind. So 3D printing, because it's become more accessible, means that the value to the end consumer goes down. Right? Why would they pay $500 for a part when they can go buy a decent printer for $250 to $400 themselves? And then they have a hobby, which is making 3D printed parts. We were driving around at a yard sale yesterday because I don't know. I enjoy that from time to time, I guess. And uh, that is something... That is an interesting one, but I saw one person at a yard sale selling 3D printed stuff. I was going to get out and talk to him, but then I very quickly realized it wasn't the kid. There was a kid and a, what I would assume was their parental guardian, which would be the way that I would put it. I'm assuming it was their father, but I don't know for sure. The kid, not interested at all in the 3D printing. The kid was, well... Not really doing much. The dad, however, was kind of looking at the 3D printed models constantly. Which tells me it's probably the dad's hobby, and the kid is just out there to hang out with the dad. If it was the other way around, where it was the kid's hobby and it was the dad, I probably would have gotten out and talked with the kid. You know, see if I could help at all. But I didn't get out. I chose not to, because they're trying to sell 3D prints. Technically, they're the competition. But I recognize that as a business, I can't look at the average individual as a competitor because they're not one 3d printer can't do more work than five right even if we were to compare the mark 3s's behind me to something like a bamboo or a frozen or a creality whatever my i have i have nine mark 3s's but if i took five mark 3s i could pump out more parts than you could on a bamboo that is a fact and that means that I'm less likely to go and change those out for other machines because they work. They're the Toyota Corollas. The singular individual does not pose a threat to a business. What they do is they pose an opportunity. That opportunity is you can work together with them or you can at least understand what they're trying to do. Looking at what they were doing, they were just selling models that they've found online. They are of no risk to me whatsoever. We do a lot of custom prototyping, and I would assume that a lot of you in the business world, in the 3D printing world, do a lot of custom work as well. When we first started this company, we wanted to be a 3D printing company, a 3D printing company only. It was very quickly understood that that was not going to work and that you needed to have value add-ons because even back in the day, why would someone pay for 3D printing alone when they could do a lot of the work themselves if it wasn't for some sort of like, I am an expert thing? We decided that we would add CAD onto it because CAD and designing in general has such a high barrier to entry. It is not easy. Any of you that have tried it understand that it is very, very difficult. That thought process that requires you, the user, to get into to be able to develop something in CAD is not something that the average individual can easily do. So, okay, if you can do the the actual CAD work, then you can prototype it. Well, they might have their own 3D printer, but hey, if you're doing the CAD, you probably know what you're doing with 3D printing. Boom. Now you have a value add. I see Steve Builds is here. Hey, Steve, how you doing? Thanks as always, buddy. By the way, you guys can check out Steve Builds' latest stream in the description down below, and we will, because now that I've learned how to do this, we're going to raid into Steve's stream when we're done here. Steve is an awesome guy, and I love him quite a bit even though I still disagree with his routing for, for belts on the Trident, and I will never let that go. <laughs> Phantom Printer asks, am I planning to upgrade any of the Mark III's to 3.5s? I am. The goal is to actually uh, upgrade most of the Mark III's 3.5s. There is pretty much no reason why you wouldn't want to do that. For 250 bucks or whatever it's costing these days, you can breathe a lot of life, a lot of life into those old machines that will make them considerably more valuable to the business. For me, I don't really care about having the next router. It's fine. Um, I'm not, 
I'm not really worried about it because we get perfectly fine first layers without it, right? Our machines are well tuned. It is a nice to have, but I don't think it's worth the extra money personally, right? I think we're going to end up doing a stream if we do. That seems to be the thing that most people are doing. They're doing streams for uh, those kinds of upgrades. So, yeah. Also, I've realized it's been 25 minutes. I have yet to do a clip of my audio. That sucks. Good job, Grant. You forgot to do it. Oh, well. Um, Steve Build says, has YouTube enabled you for gifting memberships? Um, I don't even know where that would be anymore. I can insert ads I can see, but I don't, yeah, I don't know where it would be. Like, I'm on the back end of YouTube, but I, I don't know where else I would find. Do I have to, like, view the stream? Maybe I have to view the stream, like, out in, in the open. Let me see. I don't know if that's going to be a thing. Well, let's see. Support 3D Musketeers. Hey, I can't. Uh, nope. Nope. It won't let me do that. I can do memberships, but I can't gift them. Right where you type. Yeah, nope. Um, I am not yet able to. Oh, well. Maybe it's, I, 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 did did I potentially do this wrong and set up like a brand account? I don't know. I, I don't, I don't honestly remember how we did this years ago, but oh well, is what it is. But yeah, I, we would certainly be streaming the 3 to 3.5. And see, that's, when I look at that as a business, that means that my investment as a machine is really good. Because that means I can put a little bit more money into it and... It becomes so much more valuable to me. The Mark Threes, they've been sitting idle a lot. Now, mind you, it's because we've been printing very specific materials that they don't do well, right? A Mark Three is not really great unless you enclose it for printing stuff like polycarbonate, which has been a big part of our build, right? We've been doing a lot of polycarbonate for people lately. And, uh, well, they're not great for that. Now, we might end up enclosing the whole shelf up there. That's a to-be-seen thing. But for right now, um, outside of some work with uh, the one with the diamond nozzle, which is that one, uh, the Mark Threes haven't been doing a ton of work. Although they there was some PETG parts that we did Basically, they're not getting as much use as they used to. That is not just because they're slower machines, but it is, one, also because a lot of the work we're doing is under NDA, and you guys can generally clearly see what's going on behind me, and that would violate non-disclosures because we upgraded to a nicer camera. So I got to be more careful about those things. But And that requires us to pivot. So we might end up removing those machines from behind me. I don't know yet what the plan is. The plan, at least right now, is we're going to keep making parts, but we're not so focused on the $20 orders. In fact, we are looking to raise our minimum to do business with 3D Musketeers from $20 up to $100. Because realistically, if the job is less than $100, it is not all that appropriate for a business like us to be doing. You might say, well, Grant, that's money you're leaving on the table. And it might be. We might decide that, ah, that's too much. Let's go to 50 instead. We have to try this out. We see that our average ticket right now is like $400. Well, okay. Do we get a lot of $20 clients anymore? No. Because when we get really, re people that want stuff really cheap, I just send them to a buddy of mine who is totally willing to work for pennies on the dollar. He will do parts way cheaper than we can. He will not do them at the quality that we will do them at, but that's the deal. You get stuff for cheap. You don't get it where it looks good. Okay. But the pivot for us is looking at what value is to a consumer. We want to provide 3D printing as part of a process, not a solution to a process, because that's not what it is. 3D printing is a part of it, where a lot of businesses will start out saying, this is how you solve problems. Well, it's not. It's part of the solution. It's not all of the solution. And when you look at a hammer as just a hammer and nothing else, 
you miss a lot of functionality that a hammer has. It has, most hammers have pry bars. And if they don't, and they have, let's say, multiple heads, like if it's a ball peen hammer, we have a flat head and a rounded head, that hammer now has a couple of different uses. Look at a 3D printer as a tool, because that's what it is. It is a tool. It is not a tool that provides a solution. You provide the solution. The tool is what helps you get to that solution. And as long as we remember that, I think the process ends up working out quite well. So why would we want to pivot, right? Part of pivoting is adapting to those market changes. And that goes for both hobbyists and businesses. You want to be able to adapt to those marketing changes, right? If you are running a Gen 1 Creality Ender 3, and we're already in like Gen 3, Gen 4 of the Ender 3, you might decide that you want a bigger and better Ender. You might decide that a different brand has better value for you. You might decide that these other things make more sense. You are adapting to market changes where the market for a while was just, we just need reliable filament. Then it became, we need reliable filament in a few different colors. Then it became, we need affordable filament. Then we get into this whole thing about colors, lots and lots and lots and lots of colors. Well, then Hue Forge came along and now it's, we need reliable CMYKW. Then it, it so, these are market changes and adjustments. And we see companies like Polymaker are falling very quickly and easily into this trend where they're able to say, well, we're going to put out Hue Forge packs for different colors, different types, different things that you are trying to do. This is a pivot. They are adapting to market changes and market desires. And if you say, well, I'm only going to run black PLA, right? The Henry Ford, if you will. Well, if nobody else is making a car, you can make it whatever color that you want. But if there's other people making cars and you say my car will be any color that I want as long as it is black, you are going to limit your sales. I remember vividly a example that is that if my father is listening, he knows the exact example that I'm coming up with. It was when we were looking at buying a car for my mom. She, she wanted a new car. We were at a Lexus dealer and, uh, they were out on a test drive and my father told me that the individual, like the, the salesman, when my dad said, well, we want a different color. The salesman said, well, the color doesn't matter when you're inside of it. My dad said he's never walked away from a deal faster than that. As a salesperson, you should never say the color of a car does not matter when you're inside of it. First off, I can see the color of my car when I'm inside of it. You know, the mirrors are likely going to be body color. You can generally see the hood of a car. So that's ridiculous anyways. But second off, what an absolutely stupid thing to say. Um, and I even remember the dealership too that said it. <laughs> <laughs> because it's just one of those like are, are you are you serious like are, are you actually serious right now and the answer is yes they were completely serious and that's how you lose a sale they were not adapting to the fact that people actually care about car colors right like do you want a black car in florida no you should not want a black car in florida because what you have is a rolling oven right you have a rolling oven <laughs> but you also have to make sure that you address the customer needs. That salesperson did not address the customer need. If you don't address those customer needs or your needs as an individual, see, if it's a hobby, you are the customer. If you're not addressing what your needs are, then this doesn't work, right? Spec spectra, uh, spectra, I'm going to call you Spectra. So there's a guy I work with that has an Ender 3 V1 and says that it works for him and he doesn't want to get something else. Hey, that fits his market need that fits what he wants to do with it. And okay. So he doesn't care about his time. He doesn't care about perfect print quality. The dude just wants to print off stuff every now and then. Great. It fits his needs. He's happy. But if he wants to stay up to date with this industry, changing that machine out will likely be necessary. That is just the deal, right? 
we look at filament manufacturers that have started to address customer needs. There have been a lot of videos about the plastic spools being one of the biggest problems in this industry because they're often not recyclable. And that sucks. We don't want to just keep throwing away plastic, right? While 3D printing or additive manufacturing produces less waste than CNC milling or subtractive manufacturing, the problem is the waste from 3D printing is not recyclable and reusable the same way that like aluminum or steel chips are in a injection molding or manufacturing environment. There isn't a process already in place to deal with the waste. So what happens? It gets thrown away. That goes into landfills and creates a problem that 3D printing was attempting to solve in the first place. Now, little bits of support material are not going to have anywhere near, anywhere near the problems that big plastic spools will. But cardboard spools themselves are not immune to problems either. Printed solid. Do I have one handy? No. Printed. Uh oh. Oh geez, that was rough. Um, printed solid has one of the or had they don't do it anymore. Had one of the best cardboard spools that I've ever seen. One of the best cardboard spools that I've ever seen, and I loved it. It was the one with the steel rings on it, so you could spin either side. The problem with it is it didn't fit into a bamboo AMS. It was very expensive and it was hard to source. When you have a company that all of a sudden needs to source something at the volume that a company like Printed Solid uses, I'm wearing their shirt. That this was not intended. This was not intended, but I am wearing I'm wearing some Printed Solid merch today. Not intended to use this as the example, but it worked out. You start to have an issue with getting the product right? You start to have an issue with getting said product. So they had to switch over to using the regular glued cardboard spools. Well, the problem with that is if it gets mishandled in shipping, those spools can break. And when those spools break, it goes everywhere. The filament just goes everywhere. And there's no good way to fix it. Any of you that have dealt with a spool that's fallen apart, you know what I'm talking about, where it's like, oh my God, the spool fell apart. It is often, you just want to chuck the whole damn spool and buy another one. Ugh, it sucks. And then when we start looking at like the polymaker spools, they kind of work at an AMS. And that's kind of what the standard has been. The standard is now like the bamboo AMS. If it doesn't fit in the bamboo AMS, it's not going to be a spool that customers will buy because people are buying bamboos at a ridiculous rate. So how do consumers make sure that their products will work? Well, okay, Polymaker says we don't want to change the cardboard spools, so why don't we put spool rings? Well, now I have to use the plastic to print rings, and a lot of us, myself included, will just use the crappy plastic you have laying around the house. You know, just like random spools that nobody has ordered that color for a long time, so they're just going to do it this way. I'm fine with that. But that's more plastic that you have to deal with. I think Elegoo has solved the problem the most eloquently, in my opinion. They use a glue around the edge that gives it the strength without it turning into dust. But at the same time, is that glue recyclable in the same way that the cardboard is recyclable? Because if it's not, you can't throw it away easily with cardboard. And now we get back to the same problem of that we have a recycling issue. And we will figure this out. It's going to take some time, but this is what product development looks like in a real world. This is overcoming challenges, part of a pivot. If you have a challenge in the industry, which is we don't like plastic spools, we have to overcome it by trying different methods and seeing what works the best. For me, those old print and solid spools where you could pull it apart, you had the steel, the steel could get uh, recycled, the cardboard could get recycled. That was great. I had the idea of putting wildflower seeds into it, but wildflowers are not the same everywhere in the world, not even in the United States. Heck, from state to state, they will vary. And so that doesn't work either. So I'm like, well, if I could just take my spool and throw it into my yard and I would get, you know, wildflowers for the bees, that would be great. But some wildflowers are invasive in other areas. And so that all of a sudden has logistical challenges that make it a non-continuance. It just, it doesn't work. But it would be cool. I'm just saying.
Using water-soluble glue would be great until you realize that some states like Florida are swamps and it is so humid here that even when it's cold outside, it's still humid that we run into this problem of if it's water-based, we have issues with it, right? Like Elmer's glue, it can get so damp in my garage, which is ambient moisture, that purple glue stick, if I put it onto a build plate, like a glass build plate, it will turn purple overnight. Because it gets so damp at night. So that's fun. But part of that purposeful pivot is also looking at new opportunities. You want to look at those new opportunities. Those new opportunities are important. If you don't look at those new opportunities, you are bound to kind of miss ones that could be valuable. If you miss ones that are valuable, you start to fall behind. Just like I fall behind in reminding people to like the stream, subscribe if they haven't, because we have 52 people liking. I only see 22 likes. It'd be nice if you like the video because it doesn't cost you a dime and it helps the uh, the overlords that are YouTube uh, remind that we're here and we should have more viewers. It'd be more fun to have more viewers. <laughs> but when we look at those new opportunities, you have to take advantage of it, right? So for us, we are capitalizing on new opportunities. Those opportunities come to us via clients. So like new cl new clients, right? We have a new market that we're moving into because not only did we see it's a good market, we see that there is zero competition in it. You can become a sole source provider for it and the people that we worked with on doing this project are so incredibly friendly that potentially they'll be willing to help us as well. I love that in a market where the experts in the market are willing to help the people that are trying to sell to it because they see the value that this is provided. They have a challenge of what they're trying to do. Now, I don't want to discuss that market publicly because at the moment, I'm still testing it. Once we can prove that it works and we have a scalable a business model associated with it, then I'll actually talk about it publicly because then it also becomes a bit of a, a uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Promotion. It becomes like a self-promotion for us for it as well, which I love. That's awesome. Uh, Harry Martin asks, have I looked at the 3D QF spools? No, I don't even know what they are. I don't even know who 3D QF is. Let's look it up. 3D QF. Oh, they're laser cut. So they're laser cut out of corrugated cardboard. So that's very similar to the spools that come out of uh, protopasta. I'm not a huge fan of those. I find those spools to not have enough strength, right? I find them to be very, very, very delicate as far as spools go. But man, I got a bunch of cardboard laying around, so like I kind of get it, right? But it's also why the idea of a master spool is kind of dying. Master spools, in theory, are a great idea. They're a phenomenal idea. The problem with master spools is that the first time that you fail to load that new spool and that $20 thing of plastic you just bought and now becomes a knotted up slinky all over your floor, you will write off master spools moving forward. It's, it sucks. I've done it. It's why I've written off master spools. I, they don't work for our environment. The likelihood of someone doing it wrong and failing and causing a lot of damage is very, very high. Like very, very, very high. And then when we look at the corrugated cardboard rolls, dude, you have to plan for the fact that these things are going to get drop kicked all over by shipping companies, by even your own staff. If you drop a spool, corrugated cardboard is more likely to peel that paper layer off versus like the MDF cardboard that we see coming out of printed solid and um, uh, Polymaker and some others these days. By the way, uh, Friday, we talked about that really wet roll of PETG from Polar Filament that they were using as Purge. They found it, 
and they're sending it to us. Well, actually, a fan is sending it to us who is picking up other filament from there. So thank you, J.L. Stern, for sending that my way. But we are going to get that ridiculous spool with all those bubbles in it. And yes, we are going to make a bubble lamp out of it. So stay tuned. That will be coming to the channel because it is just too cool to not use that for bubble lamps. Um, and I don't want to do a big one. And I have a really cool idea. I don't know if it's going to work, but we're going to figure it all out together. And I'm really excited to do this. Anyways, that's coming, and I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm so unreasonably excited for it. Um, so thank you, Mitch, from Polar3D. Thank you to JL Stern for getting that over to us. And I am really looking forward to trying out Polar Filament because they're made in America, and I like to support USA-made labor, USA-made materials where I can, especially when they're priced incredibly competitively. Like, dude, come on. This is awesome. But I love when we can get good businesses here in the United States that want to support hiring local people. Now, there's nobody local to me that does like actual production of filament. If they did, I'd be buying from them, too, especially if I could just go over to their factory and just buy spools off the rack. That'd be awesome because like your boy likes going on a shopping spree at printed solid. And if we ever do end up going out to Polar 3D for some reason, I will certainly go on a shopping spree there. It's just very funny how it can work sometimes. So what we've realized is it's very easy to compete on 3D printing. It's very, very, very easy to compete on 3D printing right now. You can go buy a P1S for what, 800 bucks, 900 bucks, and be able to compete with the best stuff that we can produce here. Right. There becomes a certain level where 3D printing just doesn't get better. As FDM, you are limited by the machine, period. That is a fact. You can't change that. So at some point, it's now becoming easier as 3D printing becomes a commodity to compete with machinery. So people that are necessarily more likely to do it themselves will just do it themselves. So our low dollar but high, like high throughput, like lots of parts, clients go away. But the one, two kind of parts that are very expensive, those will stay. Well, what currently isn't going crazy is metrology grade 3D scanning. There is no way to get into high end 3D scanning cheaply. You can't do it. And while you can buy like a Riva Point Morocco, which I really want, I want Riva Point to send me one because I want to compare it to my $35,000 RTEC Leo. But the difference between the Morocco and the Leo is a piece of paper. And for the work that we do, that certificate of calibration matters so much. Because that is an insurable document that states that this machine is accurate to this standard, period. It is accurate to that standard. And the software is way better. If you've ever used like Revo Points or anybody's software, for that matter, that isn't Artec or Creaform or Steinbickler, one of the big companies, you don't understand what good software is, right? And so I'm willing to spend more money where I know right now there's no competition. Right? There is no competition for us in high-end 3D scanning when it comes to consumers. There's no threat of that. And I'm willing to spend the money. It's why I have, well, this is not a Leo, but this is a Artec Eva. These run about $20,000 brand new. Um, I have a couple of these because we are going to be looking at actually renting them. So if you wanted to be able to use a incredibly expensive 3D scanner and we brought this to a show once, so if you got scanned and you got those models, you know the quality of what these scanners can produce. If you ever wanted to use one, but you didn't want to spend the, you know, even used, these are like eight to $10,000. If you could get charged $800 to $1,000 to use one of these a day, well, if you do it right, you can easily make more money than that a day by using one of those scanners. So that gives someone the opportunity to have access to that technology without having to spend all the money to get involved. 
That is a business model that we're moving into. That is not the one that I was talking about earlier, though, which is fun. I've been public about the fact that we're looking to rent the hardware for 3D scanners. That's part of the deal. But we're looking at the ever-changing market saying, all right, 3D printing is consumer-friendly at this point, right? But we're missing an education gap. We have an education problem. So, all right, we're going to move to produce educational content under a paywall, right? So it's a couple of bucks, but a couple of bucks gets you that perfect video that you're looking for. That's often something people are willing to pay for. Versus, versus having to try to find it on YouTube. And while you might be able to find it on YouTube, is it going to be as easily accessible, as easily to be found than a video that's going to cost you five to 10 bucks? No? Great. Give me the money. That's part of what education is about. You can find anything that you want in the world on the internet, right? And if you can't find it on the internet, you at least can use the internet to figure out where you can actually find it. Yet people still pay to go to college. They pay because there's that piece of paper that says, I went to college, give me more money, please. We're seeing that that happens less and less and less now because the value of college post-secondary education has gone down. So colleges are pivoting to allowing students to take classes to work towards certifications. We're seeing that colleges are valuing more than just the degree. They're providing education in a format that is not easily accessible elsewhere. That is how colleges are, are kind of combating this now fully connected era that we've run into where people are wearing Apple Vision Pros out in public and they're not doing it as a joke. <laughs> they're capitalizing on opportunities. But when you learn and you can innovate and you can look at adjusting to where you believe the market is going to, pivoting ahead of time can mean that while you're going to lose some business because of the pivot, you can be ready because that ball's already been thrown from the pitcher. You're the catcher. You're sitting there waiting for the ball to hit your glove rather than chasing after the ball. See, if you can accurately predict the way that a market is going to shift, one, you should bet on it, right? Bet on the market. But two, absolutely, if you are ready to catch that ball when it lands then you become the subject matter expert. You are the person that people seek. So if you can see that 3D scanning is getting a lot of value in your area and you want to start with cheap 3D scanners to play and learn and you can build up enough money to buy a big scanner, now all of a sudden you are the subject matter expert for 3D scanning and you are the person or the people or the business or whomever that is who it becomes. I'm gonna call out one of our one of our Patreon members. Um, great guy. Uh, his name is Russ. Russ reached out because Russ is looking to get a scanner. Now, I don't particularly ask why, but sometimes I do. Russ wants to get the Einstar, which, in my opinion, is one of the best scanners under ten grand that you can get. It's a great scanner. But I told Russ, hey, if you don't have a computer with rip roaring rocking specs, the Einstar is not going to be a good scanner for you because the software is not well made. So the $900 scanner often needs like a two or three thousand dollar laptop. But it's still a cheap scanner, even with the laptop, because the laptop provides you more value than just what the scanner can do, right? Mike from Nerdlip Machines Win says, value has gone down, so membership students has gone down, so education costs have increased. Yep. Yep. I, I certainly look at school a little bit differently now than when I did, but I also look at what I would do differently. If I was in school right now, I'd be going after coding, right? I'd be going after coding. I'd be going after hardcore engineering, right? I'm not talking like just generical mechanical engineering, generical, generic mechanical engineering. I'd be going after aerospace engineering. I would be going after biochemical engineering. I'd be going after hyper specific topics where when I graduated college my first time in 2012, 
so 12 years ago, I would have said different back then and said, well, a more generic degree has more value to you so that you can kind of figure out where you want to be. Today's day and age, you really got to know exactly what you want to do and get a degree that's hyper specific if you want to stand out among some of the people that did just get generic ass degrees. I don't like that, but I don't really think it's wrong either. I don't know. What, what, let me know what you guys think about that. I think the hyper specification helps out, or maybe it's a double major or a major with a minor, but you can't just go for that generic degree anymore because that generic degree, well, makes you generic. And if you need to stand out among a crowd, if you want to adapt to market changes, if you want to address the needs of an employer or the customer, if you will, and if you want to overcome challenges, being generic doesn't get you any of that. You want to be specific. Part of the business of pivoting, though, is also that resource optimization, more specifically, time optimization. If you can optimize your time in a business, you can make more money. We've talked about this before, but if you double your prices and you lose half of your business, you are making more money. That is a fact. That is a legitimate, honest to God fact because you're paying, you're paying less in credit card fees. Your taxes are going to roughly be the same, but you're dealing with less customers because you're getting so much extra time back. You, ha you don't have to deal with double the clients. You deal with half of the clients, the same amount of money. You now have more time to get more clients at that double rate. You are optimizing your res. I think Nero and I even talked about it last week where when we're looking at printing for print farms, we have like four options. It's either going to take less than 12 hours, less than 18 hours, less than 20 hours, or above 24 hours. Those are the four types of builds that we have. If it's less than 12 hours, it gets started first thing in the morning. It's done before we're, we're done for the day. If it's 18 hours, we start it eh, sometime early morning, and it's done sometime overnight. If the part finishes at 2 a.m. versus finishing at 6 a.m., it is effectively the same for me. So I don't care. If it is 20 hours, it has to be started dead early in the morning so it can finish and cool down so the next one can start dead early in the morning. And then there's the 24 hour plus where you start it wherever the hell that you want and it finishes whatever the hell it wants. But you will eventually lose a six to eight hour gap of when you are asleep unless you're willing to get up in the night because the part at some point, if it's more than 24 hours, if you start at 8 a.m. and finishes at 10 a.m., then the next one finishes at noon, the next one finishes at 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, then it starts getting into 2, 4, 6, 8 the next day. That's where you start losing time. And that might be okay. You might be okay with that. And at some point, it is what it is. But if you can optimize your build plates to get done within the time that makes sense to you, then hey, you have done it successfully. But that's where a faster printer might have more value to you as well. If your machine can pump out parts three times as fast, you go from literally a part that I was looking at doing on uh, one of my slower printers, a Fusion 3 F410, takes about 12 and a half hours on it, where on the Magneto X, it's six and a half. Well, okay, wait a minute. That part I can now do two of those a day instead of one a day. And those parts are worth like 350 bucks each. Yeah. All of a sudden you start to realize the value in this is well beyond just your time. But it's machine time as well. Mike says, I suck at waking up to switch prints. Too many years of muscle memory hitting the snooze button. That's okay, right? You don't have to get up to switch prints. I, I don't do it much anymore. Um, I used to, but I recognize that if I'm not getting paid to wake up in the middle of the night to switch a print over... Yes, my dear. Or, or, okay. If I'm not getting paid to wake up in the middle of the night to switch a print over... All right, Miss Victoria, I'm sorry. You can't be on the keyboard. If I'm not getting paid to wake up in the middle of the night to switch a print over, I'm probably not going to do it. 
because there's no point. If you're not going to pay me to make it an emergency for, for me, then I'm likely not going to. Come on. Come on. Miss Vicky. Come on. It's okay. 3D Protofab is here saying, I'm a little late to the party, but I'm here working on company name changes. By the way, formerly NH3D Canada. Cheers. Um, I'd be very careful about that new name because Protofab is very close to Proto Labs, which is a publicly traded 3D printing service bureau. So um, it would be very difficult for you, I think, to get ranked on Google, but I'm not an SEO expert by any stretch of the imagination. Jake says, in my experience, most companies are happier with more versatile applicants. Versatility usually equals trainability, which is better than hyper-specific to one tech that is already dated by graduation. That's a very fair point, but it also depends on what the business is looking for, right? Trainability and a generic hire is not going to pay as well as a hyper-specific hire will. So I guess it, 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 it kind of would serve to what are you going for as a job, right? But where is it? Uh, yeah, Tom Taylor says, work experience. At 55, I get turned down so much for having too much experience. First off, that's ridiculous. Uh, no company should turn you down for having too much experience. I would never turn somebody down for having too much experience as long as they could prove that they could assimilate well into the company culture, right? Company culture is uh, way too important these days because it is easy to lose valuable people because they don't feel welcomed in their own environment, right? You might love your job, but if you hate your manager, then you hate your job. Right? Maybe you love your coworkers, but your manager's a real piece of work. Then you start to hate the job, right? That's the part that sucks. That's the part that really sucks. Mike says, I get tied up. I get up for tight deadlines or when print failures have used up my buffer time. Yep. Been there. Freaking been there. Um, yeah. Uh, part of understanding the business of this is also understanding that things will take longer than you think. And I still learn this from time to time because I, I sometimes forget that the speed that I could do it in is not the speed that our staff could do it in. And if I want it to be done faster, I got to do it myself. That's the part that sucks. I don't always want to do the work myself, so I have to give more time out there for it to be done by others part of the deal yes my dearest i know mom just left to go skating so that means you need all of the attention right now isn't that right you need all of the attention the cat needs all of the attention and she needs all of the likes leave a like on the video for the cat um anyways a part of the uh, the big reason we see a lot of companies pivot especially small businesses that is all because they're trying not to fail, right? A big pivot. Like you see a company go from, I'm trying to think of like a big pivot that I've seen recently. God, I can't think of one because big pivots don't tend to work either. But if you see a business making a massive pivot where they go from like, I can't even think of a good, I can't even think of a good example. But if you see a massive pivot in a business where their entire core business model is changing, then really they're just trying to leverage their name and they're not trying to leverage anything that they're actually doing anymore. And as Seabass says, the problem with too much experience is that most companies are not willing to pay for that up front. They'd rather get someone with less experience and train them in-house. That is true to some extent. I, I think that specifically for um for tom's issue it might also be the age it's a concern right it's illegal but you also can't prove it you can't prove that people aren't hiring you because you're too old but it is a concern that anyone that is older that is looking to get a new job has right those are instances where yeah if they know you're going to retire in x amount of years they might say no just because of that, which is stupid. I don't I don't like that at all. We've had staff that are quite old. We've had staff that are quite young. 
I don't care what your age is. I don't care. I just care that you're proficient, man. I care that you're proficient and you're not a jerk. If you can solve all of those problems, then great. You've got it sorted as far as I'm concerned. But it does suck that people will end up, you know, judging a book by its cover. When I find that a lot of the, uh, the seasoned veterans that we work with have so much more to provide than they even think. And a lot of it comes in the form of wisdom of, you know, lessons learned because of mistakes made when they were my age or they were younger. And they're like, Hey, by the way, that's not going to work. Here's why. And yeah, it's kind of valuable if you can just every now and then just listen. Like Amber, Amber has worked at the same hospital for years and she's worked there for years because she loves her manager. She loves her coworkers. And because that's not a traditional thing in a hospital, you don't generally like both of those things, S but she travels very far, right? Her drive can be upwards of 45 minutes each way to work, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you realize it's like 40 miles each way, it's a lot. But she does it because she'd rather have a commute than be miserable in her day job. So, yeah. Tom Taylor has never proved it, but one escorted me out of the building for fear of me taking his job down the road. Man. I don't get that. Like, if you're afraid that others are going to take your job, why don't you just... Do better at your job. And if you can't do better at your job, then work with your managerial team. Ask them, hey, am I performing well? I feel like I'm not performing well. And a manage a good manager will tell you, well, you know, we could see better here. No, actually, you're hitting all the marks. Where do you feel you're not performing well? How can I help you potentially perform better? We've put a lot of value on the dollar. And we as a community put less value on the individual. I put a lot of value on the dollar, but I put a lot more value on the individual because we wouldn't be where we're at without our team. 3D Musketeers wouldn't be where it's at without its team, without our director of marketing and director of HR. We wouldn't be where we're at. And certainly without our editors, without our engineers, without our graphic designers, without just the people that keep the wheels turning, we wouldn't be where we're at. Now, certainly this company wouldn't exist, period, if it wasn't for me. But the goal of a good manager is to make yourself replaceable. Because if you can be replaced, you have an opportunity to move up a ladder to go to a better position. As a business owner, I would love to delegate every aspect of my job. We don't have the income to do that, but I would love to be able to do it. And so I work closely with our engineering team that want to do this kind of thing where, all right, how do we provide more client facing roles for engineers without putting them into situations where they become uncomfortable? We are pivoting to add more client facing roles for engineers so that engineers work directly with clients rather than me just doing it myself. It sucks, but I love it. I love making those kinds of changes. It hurts because I know we're going to fail. I know we're going to have failure, but that's okay. Because as long as we come back from that and say, well, all right, maybe, maybe Grant should be involved here, but maybe here he, he doesn't have to be. We get to learn a better way for us to operate as a business, to become more time efficient. We can innovate where I can focus on that next big thing for the business rather than staying in it. It's the idea of working on your business versus in your business. And when you can quickly, quickly make that shift, you can succeed as a business owner and be able to trust that your team, if you've trained them and you have good people training them, can survive without you. Because if they can't survive without you, you have a hit by a bus problem. If you get hit by a bus tomorrow and your business ceases to exist, you have a lot of people that have been relying on you for money that all of a sudden have to find other sources. That's not fun.
Seabass says many companies have this quiet quitting toxic behavior, thinking that you have to overwork yourself for the company instead of just working the agreed upon hours. Dude, I'm kind of so glad that quiet quitting has become a thing because you know what? About damn time, about damn time that workers realize that if you are only getting paid to work from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., at 5.01, your phone does not belong to the company anymore. Stop answering work calls if you're not getting paid. Now, if you're a salary employee, it's a little bit different. But if you're an hourly employee, bill the hours. Like I tell our staff, if we are meeting for some reason, bill. If you are on a call with a client and I bill it. It's all billable hours. Just because you don't think it's billable does not mean it's not billable. And I might choose to absorb those extra billable hours as my cost, right? I might choose to absorb it and say, that's part of my profit margin that I'm relinquishing because I want our staff to understand that their time has money. If their time doesn't have that money, doesn't have that value to them, then I can't expect them to think that it does to me. They need to see it. We've been working on hiring a new editor, right? And you guys actually, if you've watched the credits, you've noticed it. We have a new editor. We have two editors now. And in, in trying to do the hire, I went through a lot of interviews. Those interviews included making sure that they could do the job. So I sent them a raw video and said, I want you to edit this down. Okay. But I'm also going to pay you. Really? You're going to pay me for a test? Absolutely, I'm going to pay you for a test because you need to realize that your value is there. Now, does that mean that I spent well over $2,000 hiring a new editor? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think we spent like almost four grand trying to find a new editor, but that value is there for me because I need to teach people that they, that their time has value to it. If they don't, then yeah, it's a problem. Like, don't get me wrong. And we, we pay well, right? We pay very well especially for our engineers, because the engineer value is immediate to me. Editing value is tough because right now we don't, we're not profitable on YouTube. So it's hard for me to pay like $80 an hour for an editor because, oh yeah, it doesn't make sense. Like I just got the bill for the, uh, for the bamboo log video. That bamboo log video cost me almost $400 in editing time. That doesn't include all that same time that I was there with the editor working on it too. It doesn't include the weeks of research, time, effort, multiple takes and stuff that I put into it. That is just a hard cost for that video. And because we didn't monetize that video, that money will never come back to us. But we did it because we wanted to show the truth, right? Part of seeking truth is that you make sure that you don't do it for profit reasons you do it for truth reasons and that's what i told the editor and we joked i said so how many hours could you have cut if i wasn't there asking you questions she said i probably could have done it in half the time but it would not have been exactly what you wanted and we would have had to go back and forth back and forth back and forth back and forth it made more sense to all of us to do it this way regardless of how we felt doing it in the first place <laughs> I didn't want to be there the whole time, but it made more sense to do it. Max H says, I want to work for Grant. Well, if you have CAD skills and you are wanting to work for 3D Musketeers, we are currently hiring engineers. You don't have to be an engineer, but you have to be proficient in Fusion, which is now Fusion, not just Fusion 360. It is now Fusion. And you must have access to the Fusion cloud. If you have access to that, you can potentially work for 3D Musketeers. You can email me, youtube at 3dmusketeers.com. We'll set up an interview. Um, so, yeah, there you go. See, I can add even my little bits of, uh, you know, self-promotion in there, too. Just like liking the video is important. It's important. And as Mike says, your salary is based on standard length workday. It is. But I believe if I'm going to have to work a little bit extra on the weekend, then I can come in late Monday. And that's totally fair. 
And if they're not going to let me do that, then I'm not going to do the extra work for them anymore. A job that understands that, yeah, okay, if you want me to work late on a Thursday, that means I'm leaving early on Friday, baby. Because, yeah, my time is worth that. But unfortunately, it doesn't mean uh, if you're salary, uh, salary exempt, I think, you don't get overtime. Um, so if you were required to work more than 40 hours in a week, you wouldn't get that overtime. And overtime is important to make you realize that when you're working more than 40 hours a week, you should get paid more. Gosh. Matt German says, I bill you, I bill you for watching you. Just kidding. How are you today? I'm fine. You can't bill me for watching me. If anything, I should be billing you guys for watching this, but we're not going to do that. What we're going to do is have pay gated content. Um, and it's why we pay gate the discord at the $10 tier higher links in the description down below to come hang out with myself and the 3d musketeers crew in our discord server. It's why we put a pay gate on that because you get effectively like access to me one-on-one -on -one. for 10 bucks a month. Honestly, like it's cheap. It is the cheapest way to get help with your 3d printers. It's the cheapest way to get an inside look at what it takes to run a YouTube channel uh, successfully or otherwise is debatable, but it, it, you, you get it. You effectively get an inside look. I was cooking dinner last night with Amber and we were in the discord, just hanging out with people for like an hour and a half. It was great, but that's what we do. We're kind of weird that way. So, if you got 10 bucks to spare every month, it's cheaper than Netflix, right? Isn't Netflix more expensive? And uh, I like to have fun. And just as it is the cheapest way to get picked on, that's fair. It's also the cheapest way to pick on me. <laughs> Tom Taylor says, I'm 64 now. I don't have to worry about that anymore. Yeah. Feel that. Well, I hope you are, if you are, if you are retired, I hope you're enjoying your retirement. That's the big deal. Enjoy that retirement. Enjoy that time. I miss Allison's comment and I want to bring it up. Uh, Allison says, you know, my story, master's degree in material science and engineering that I never got to use because no one would give me a chance to get that experience that everywhere wanted. Yeah. Allison is one of our longest standing fans. Allison has been a fan of the channel since before I was talking about 3D printing. Allison found us when we had when we called out Cricket years ago for acting like pieces of garbage. And Allison's been a fan ever since. Allison now has two 3D printers, I think, and really enjoys the hobby. But Allison has amazing skill sets, like is incredibly brilliant, but nobody ever gave her the chance to prove it. And that sucks. You want to know how you get really jaded of an industry? You go through what Allison went through. And I'm sure that not being a dude didn't help either, right? Because unfortunately, the engineering world's kind of sexist, and I hate it. I wish that we welcomed women, or non-male, I should say, into the industry way more than we do it's wrong it's wrong that we gate it and say well you can only be an engineer if you're a dude i have had some of the best success with lady engineers way more than i've had with some of the guys that we've hired but i'll say lady engineers are uh real tough to get because unfortunately the stem stuff doesn't skew toward female and that sucks that really sucks my age says sorry too long commute from michigan Boy, that sucks. It's a shame that all of our engineers are remote. It's a shame that all of our engineers are remote. Hell, our lead engineer for over five years, I only met him late last year. I had never met this guy. We met because we were working on a project. He was an engineer on the project. I was the printer and we both got screwed by the same client and we became friends over a mutual disdain for that one individual. That That is literally how we became friends and he was our lead engineer for many years. And he's still on the team. It just doesn't take up a lot of jobs anymore because his day job abuses his free time. That sucks too, man. He's such a great, such a great worker. So much fun to hang out with too. But yeah, all of our engineers are remote, dude. <laughs> like, the bulk of our engineers I've never met.
before and statistically will never meet. It was pretty cool to meet a couple of them when we were out in uh, in the UK, though. We got to meet Zach finally. Zach is an awesome kid. Like, truly amazing. Um, anyways. And Max, as long as you like Michigan State, because that's where my dad went to school. If you like University of Michigan, I don't know if this is going to work. <laughs> but yeah, look. I firmly believe that businesses, if they're not going to pivot, are doomed to fail. They're doomed to fail. And if you as a hobbyist don't shift what you're into, what you're doing and why, you're doomed to burn out. You're just doomed to burn out. You can have that Gen 1 Ender 3 that you love, but when that thing starts giving you problems and someone says, oh, just buy another printer, and that's all you hear, you're going to get pissed that your current printer doesn't freaking work, right? You're going to get pissed that that doesn't work. I want to see more people understanding that flexibility is what actually makes a good business. Having rigid, hard, immobile business practices, they don't work. You got to be a little bit flexible, man. That's what pivoting is all about to me. We are going to be making a purposeful pivot here in 2024 to do more high-end metrology-grade 3D scanning. You're going to see a lot more scanning in content that we're doing. You're going to see me doing a lot more live streams where I'm just scanning stuff and we're just going to be hanging out and I'm going to be showing you guys how it works, why it works, the kind of accuracy that we're getting and more. That is happening this year. And I have a backlog of stuff I need to scan for friends. And if I'm going to scan stuff for friends and I ain't getting paid for it, then I'm going to do it for fun. Damn it. Because that, you know, it's worth it. Look, pivoting is important to survival. You do it all the time. You just don't realize it. Right? You don't dress like you're 15 anymore. You know, you, you likely grew out of the angsty teenager phase. So you don't dress like that anymore. Why? Because your current situation requires you to dress differently. You guys saw me wear a lot of polos for a long time. A lot of those, you know, two, three button collared shirts because that's all that I had. Now that we start having our own merch with t-shirts, we have companies that send us merch from time to time that we get to wear or we pick it up when we go to their facilities and all that. I like repping other brands too. But you often see that in our recorded videos, I am normally wearing my own branding. Where before I wear a lot of just like generically gray t-shirts. Now I wear generically gray t-shirts with my cat on them. Because it's part of a good brand. It's just part of a good brand. And I'm pivoting to understand that. Pivoting is an important factor in life. And it's why that rigidity can often be the downside that a lot of people don't see coming until well after it's already passed them. And they now have to play catch up. And as Siba says, cat t-shirts are better than regular shirts. They are. I am still trying to find a good t-shirt printer. It's been a challenge and I'm sorry. But we do have some really awesome designs coming out that I am hoping to turn into clothing as well. Coming soon, TM. It, it's, been a, it's been a real big challenge to find a good, reliable, consistent t-shirt company that we can work with. Because um, either I like the printing quality, but their color consistency sucks, or I like their color consistency, but the printing is not the highest quality. It all just depends, and I hate that. So... We'll see. I have some more tests to run. I have some more shirts that I need to get tested. And then we decide what our next goal is. Our next goal at this point as a company is to do more scanning. But at the same time, we are heavily focusing on YouTube. You don't get two editors because you're not focusing on YouTube. Right? 
I want to focus on big, fun project videos. I want to do more videos like the one I'm going to be doing here with the Magneto X, where we really look into it. And we talk about it because we've been beta testing this machine, and I want to show you guys what it's like to beta test a machine. And some of the challenges that come along with it, because it's not been all puppy dogs and rainbows. There have been some serious challenges involved in that process that what I want to talk about, because I want to be one of the first people to talk about the Magneto X in a video. I think it's important to get that content out when we can, but also I think it's really cool to show it off because the magnetic linear drive system is super bloody cool. Mike says, are you a t-shirt company or are you a content company? Well, a little bit of both, right? I mean, I could talk about the business model around merch if you want, but it is a pivot that we decided to do where we needed to produce merch. The reason that we chose it is the average viewer is worth about a tenth of a penny, right? Based on CPM numbers, our average viewer is worth about a tenth of a penny. Well, if I can get one in every thousand viewers to buy a shirt, I will make way more net profit, which we can put immediately back into paying more people, paying people better, and being able to do more unique things that have a higher expense to it. Because right now, every video that we do is a loss. Right? We're going to be traveling to Rocky Mountain. We don't yet have a sponsor. That is currently a massive financial loss. Okay. I still enjoy doing it, so I want to do it. But we have to find a system that works. So we work to find it. Right now, for me, it is about finding a way that we can pay our people better. And if I'm lucky, a little bit of money for myself, too. That's the reason we're doing shirts. It is all to push a little bit more profit. It is to make sure that our staff can get paid better so we can give raises to our editors without literally just taking it out of nowhere, right? Taking it out of my net profit to give it to editors. We can take it out of profit that we are making from the channel, which has a lot of value to them. And we're looking at doing a revenue share where we share some of that net profit with the team in the editing department so that when they do good edits, they get a bonus for it effectively. That's part of the deal. So, yeah. Seabass asked me if I checked Bunker Branding. Many channels use it. I've looked into them. They do screen printing. I'm looking for DTG. The thing with, like, what Bunker is looking for, they want large brands. They want large brands because to do screen printing, the screens are expensive. Storing them is expensive and you need one screen per color. Our shirts are very, very heavily colored. These are where they store the inventory. It's likely some sort of consignment system. I want print on demand where I don't have to maintain inventory at this time. We will eventually look to maintain inventory, but we're not, we're not likely to sell enough volume for it to make sense. My brother has talked about us just like converting, you know, part of the garage into storage for merch and all that. And I said, no, because then I also have my time involved in bagging it, shipping it and all of that. I'd much rather go with a company who can do all of that for us worldwide that's where i want to be right now will that change if i can start to delegate more of my roles or hire people just to do the merch sure but we're not at that point where the merch is bringing in any money let alone some money to be able to cover its own expenses let alone anything else i have well over five grand in shirts that I've just tried some are good some are bad you there have been there have been companies we've ordered from that I just I don't like the shirts they go into a closet and I use them when I compare from company to company so yeah art of the pivot is a big one and you got to make sure you do it right if you don't pivot properly you pivot into the wrong area right As someone that used to dance a lot and I've started to go back dancing a little bit more now that I'm at least on a decent path to getting my, my, my back resolved. Pivoting is a dance move. It, it is a dance move. But if you do it in the wrong direction, you do it against what your partner is trying to do and things don't go correctly, you get to have a little bit of a laugh. In a dance, a laugh is okay. 
in a business, a laugh often actually is a loss of finance. Nobody ever wants to see a business lose money just because they made a bad decision. It's not what I want, at least. I want to see businesses prosper. I want to see them grow, be better. But to do that, you got to make the right decisions. You win some, you lose some. I've certainly lost a bunch before, but that's how it goes. By the way, I'm also hiring a content writer. If someone can do good writing, I don't specifically need a technical writer, but someone with some basic, th like if you're watching this podcast or listening to this podcast and you have writing skills and you're not utilizing them and you want to utilize them, you should email me because I need a writer. We have a business model that we want to try because I see some value in it and I'm willing to put some cash into it to find out. So if you have the ability to write good content, right? Let me know because I would love to hire a writer. A lot of writers like to get paid by the word. I'm not so certain I like that practice, but if you are the type of writer that likes to get paid by the word, I would love to know why. For me, I'd rather pay by the hour because if there's like some sort of research you need to do, when you're doing it by the word, you don't get paid for that research. I'd rather pay you by the hour so that you get paid for the research. These are things that, these are my understanding of how people should get paid. And if you have a different understanding, please let me know. But if you are a writer, I really am. Look, I am actually looking for a writer more than I'm looking for engineers at this point. But I will take both. Anyways, enough self-promotion. We are actively hiring. A lot of companies are actively hiring right now. But yeah, if you can write, email me. Like, please. Because I have a business model. I really want to try it out. Anyways. That is going to call it, I think. I think that's pretty much, I, I think I covered, I'm pretty sure I covered everything, right? I did, didn't I? Challenges, benefits, why business would, and what is pivoting, and why should you care? Yeah, I think I did it, right? Pretty sure I did it, right? Uh, Let me see here. I am going to add a redirect so that we can uh we can redirect people into steve's stream as soon as we're done um yeah recommend steve <laughs> i do recommend you guys go check out steve builds and we're done here uh and let steve know that you came from 3d musketeers it's good that steve knows that i am still remembering to send people there and now that i know how to do the redirect thing i uh I like doing it. So. All right, peeps. I'm going to get out of here. Enjoy the rest of your day. I don't know. If you guys want to see some future guests on this show, let me know. I want to start getting more guests back on here now that we're kind of through the potential minefields that have been the past few videos that we've done. Uh, I want to get more guests on here. So if you guys have any guests you'd like to see, email me, DM me on Twitter, message me in Discord if, if we're in a mutual server together. Um, want to start getting interesting guests on here that have some cool stories that they can share. Maybe it's a, you know, I'm like when we had frankly built on here, right? Like I should, I should get Frank back on here, but you know, just have more interesting people that we can talk about here on the show. But that is all I have for you guys today. Leave a like, get subscribed, support us on the social medias. If that's the thing you want, I do need to invite Adrian Boyer. Holy crap. He would be, he'd be a cool freaking guest. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta get with Adrian. See if we can get Adrian Boyer on here. That'd be cool. Anyways, I'm gonna call the stream here. You all enjoy the rest of your day. Stay safe out there. Don't forget to call your loved ones. And as always, keep making awesome. Episode 176. Call your loved ones, damn it. <laughs>